Amniotes are a diverse group of tetrapods that have specifically adapted to survive in a terrestrial environment by laying amniotic eggs. The development of this egg is important to the evolutionary history of amniotes because it freed them from needing to lay their eggs in water and led to the rise of the amniotes by Lucas Young and Rebecca Staub. It is theorized that amniotes diverged from an amphibian ancestor during the Carboniferous period, roughly 300 million years ago. Our current understanding of the evolutionary origins of amniotes is that there was a divergence between the synapsids and the sauropsids, meaning lizard faces. The sauropsids, more commonly known as the reptiles, are further divided into the parareptiles, the turtles, and the diapsids. The synapsids and the diapsids are differentiated by the number of fenestrae, or windows, in their skulls. Diapsids have two openings on either side of their skull, allowing for the contraction of strong jaw muscles and a wider opening of the mouth. The synapsids, with only one fenestra, developed incisors and molars to cope with their less developed jaw musculature. Now that we have a brief understanding of how amniotes are classified, Let's discuss the conditions which may have led to their divergence from their amphibian ancestors. In order to move into the terrestrial environment, you'd need a um, food source, habitat, uh, all the, the various components of habitat that animals need. And so likely, I think what people think happened or occurred was during about 350 million years ago, um, it was a very wet, swampy time, and that was dominated by amphibians. Um, and then during the late, around 340 million years ago or so, uh, organisms started, or the amniotes evolved. And what people think is what happened was that, um, or one theory is that the plate tectonics were going on, so continents were colliding, and uh, you had an, a shift in elevational gradients, which result, resulted in more terrestrial environments. And those terrestrial environments were dry or drier. But how do we know what conditions would have led to the rise of the amniotes? I, we, we can't ever be absolutely sure. We can certainly look at kind of paleoclimate and kind of what's going on around this time. Certainly one of the large changes that was going on is kind of the development of land life at all. Um, certainly, you know, there being resources on land that these organisms could exploit. The, the predecessors to current amniotes were probably some sort of carnivorous and reptilian-like amphibian. Um, and, and so really, they're going to only kind of emerge to either move from one body of water to another, and that could have helped spark this, but also to kind of exploit terrestrial resources. So you're seeing the diversification of land plants at this point. You're seeing the emergence of terrestrial arthropods. Um, and so all of these really are providing kind of an untapped kind of food source that they could come out and exploit. So in terms of the climate and the habitat, what, what really may have sparked this is A, the, the development of terrestrial biota, but also probably changes in the environment that are leading towards, say, high rates of evaporation. These things are living in pools that are now, you know, dis dissipating more rapidly. There's going to be more impetus for them to, say, move on to uh, land and, and develop the ability to survive on land. Um, and again, the ability to move farther away from water sources and really utilize these resources um, is going to necessitate both a adult body characteristics that are uh, allowing them to survive and you know, prevent desiccation, but ultimately, you know, and what's key with the amniotes is the ability to reproduce in areas away from water. One thing that can really push that would be, again, warming climate, drier climate, leading to more temporal water sources. So if these organisms are laying eggs in the water, but periodically those water bodies dry up, that's a strong evolutionary pressure to start having eggs that are going to be more drought resistant, right? And this would probably take the initial form of kind of a tougher outer coating. Um, if you look at current, you know, modern eggs of, say, amphibians, they're, they're very soft, gelatinous, they would desiccate very quickly. But you quickly end up with a problem as, as you're increasing, say, the, the outer coating and the durability of the coating on the outside of that egg. 
suddenly you run into some severe problems with respiration, you start running into problems with waste removal, and that's really going to be, you know, the direct evolutionary impetus for starting to create things like the amnion that's going to separate, you know, the fetus and the fluids immediately surrounding the fetus with, say, waste products. You're going to start developing uh, membranes that are going to allow for better oxygen transport um, so that these organisms aren't just suffocating within their own shell. On the left is an amniotic egg with a semi-permeable calcium carbonate shell which protects the developing embryo from external hazards. Just inside of the shell are the chorion and the lontuus, which allow for gas exchange within the egg, bringing in new oxygen and allowing for harmful carbon dioxide to be excreted. The yolk and the albumin provide nourishment for the developing embryo, and the amnion, which develops into the amniotic sac for which the class is named, separates the embryo from the other fluids within the egg. Note the difference between the amniotic egg and the amphibian egg on the right, which is comprised of an embryo, a yolk sac which offers nourishment to the developing embryo, and a jelly which offers protection but necessitates an aquatic environment. So which came first, the amniote or the egg? So, so it's got to be some pressure that's basically causing things to die unless they change. Um, and, and really when you're looking at the you know, exploitation of resources, you can have organisms, and there are lots of organisms that do this, that have their reproduction tied to aquatic systems, but then the adults are highly mobile and able to go inland and, and to exploit them. For the development of these reproductive traits, that means that what existed had to be selected against. Um, and you know, again, this is pure speculation, but in my mind, probably the, the evolutionary uh, kind of environment that would really drive that would be kind of this temporal water availability really leading to desiccation in eggs. And then once you start developing those traits, then it's like, oh, well, maybe I don't always have to lay my eggs in the water. Maybe wet mud is okay. What adaptations have evolved that allow these organisms to exploit terrestrial resources? Now, certainly, the amphibians were living in, in the terrestrial world, but they just hadn't taken advantage of it, and they still had a relatively permeable skin. So probably one of the, the, the most important changes um, was the development of impermeable skin, which essentially just allowed organisms to last longer in the terrestrial environment without uh, drying out. Inherent with that transition, though, and one that a lot of people don't really think about, is also the development of the lung. Um, you know, when we look at these semi-aquatic organisms, the amphibians in particular, a lot of their respiration occurs through their skin. Once you start developing things like thick skin and scales, that's not happening. So now you need a much more efficient organ for oxygen transfer in the adult, right? Um, so the, the development of the lung really coincides with this. It's probably at least somewhat related to kind of the, the development of these larger membranes within the egg as well, because what you're also seeing is that larval stage no longer has gills, right? So now it's having these structures within the egg itself that are fulfilling the function of gas exchange, and then you're seeing earlier development of that internal lung. In addition to the evolution of a more efficient lung and a less permeable egg and skin, there was an evolutionary pressure to develop stronger, more rigid skeletal systems. This is called pachyostosis. The thickening of the bones is kind of an interesting double-edged sword, right? You know, you're out of the water, so you need to support yourself more. But because you have to support yourself more, you're more conscious about weight, right? So, so thickening of the bones are required to support that weight, but to a limit. <laughs> um, and, and really, probably what I'd say is the, the, then the more important facet of that is kind of the, the microstructure of the bone, and then of course the musculature associated with that bone had to change quite a bit to allow for, in this case, quadrupedal movement across the land and, and self-supported movement. The evolution of the amniotes marks a major milestone of tetrapod development, and we arguably owe our existence to the series of evolutionary events which allowed for a life less tied to aquatic systems. Although the amniotes are most commonly known for possessing an amniotic egg after which they are named, the development of a less permeable skin, a respiratory system able to respire in a terrestrial environment, and a skeletal system rigid enough to offer adequate support outside of water all enabled this group of tetrapods to capitalize on a myriad of niches over the last 300 million years, giving rise to the amniotes.